to extend this thank you to my senior friends who came to support me. Uh, I would like to start off with a question. How many of you have experienced racism? Thanks, Mom. <laughs> well, I have one point in my life that stood out a lot more than anything else. Now, this one time in freshman year, I was walking home to the train station, as you know, all of us students do, and there's a group of four police officers in full tactical gear. Why did they wear full tactical gear? Um, this is a question I have asked myself almost every time going through the train station. There's no emergency that would ever happen in a train station that would require a gun bigger than your dog. I just think that's quite interesting. Um, so there's this moment that, you know, I wasn't expecting anything. I was just walking home and we had a field trip that day. I had a small little sling bag and all of a sudden, my heart dropped. One of the police dogs barked at me. Now, maybe it's just because I smelled bad. You know, all freshmen in voice, <laughs> shower and axe. Or maybe it was just my little Maltese dog at home. That dog barked at me. And that kind of changed everything. The police officers looked at the dog, looked at me, talked to one another, and walked over. They dumped out my bag, and after they found nothing, they told me I could go. I was frozen with fear, from the moment the dog barked to the moment that they walked away. All the memories of my mother telling me that I couldn't wear a hood in the dark, and police brutality all over the news, and something bad that would happen to me, just flashed in my mind at a thousand miles per hour. It's fear. It's that same fear that stopped me from telling my parents that that happened to me that day. It's that same fear that controlled me for the rest of that month. And I thought about it, I avoided that train station for the rest of the year. And this was in April. Fear makes me look at police officers twice, their guns three times, and their skin once. And I believe that fear is the true drive of racism. As a kid, I was sheltered. I lived in the gated community of Glen Point, full of sweet white old ladies. They uh, fed me grapes by the pool. It's great. <laughs> and this is the same community that was so secure that my mom could just rattle off the names of the security guards at the gate. Everybody, we even uh, went to a viewing party for a couple of them. And I remember life was just so perfect. I had nothing to worry about. I didn't have to worry about whether I was going to get stopped on my walk home or anything. And we escaped every Sunday to Mount Olive Baptist Church to voice our prayers. And Mount Olive Baptist Church, if you guys don't know, because of course you don't know, is the type of uh, black, jumpy, up and downy sing song <laughs> church that, if you know me or my mom, is perfect. Uh, I absolutely loved it, but as a kid, I hated it. <laughs> oh, that was a little loud. Wow. It was the only place that we could be. That same hope and faith was my gateway into the world of racism. Because in 2012, Trayvon Martin was shot and killed by George Zimmerman. We, the church, marched out from Mount Olive to the city hall, approximately two miles for a kid that none of us knew. Not a single one of us knew this kid, but we treated him like a brother, like a son, like a family member. We all felt his pain, and we walked for justice. As an adult, a six foot two black man, I feel absolutely proud to be who I am. I couldn't be happier. But deep down, I feel like a big target, both literally and figuratively. This world has thankfully been kind to me in the sense of racism. But the occasional person watching my hands in my pockets whenever I go into a store or remarks that I could just be in the uh, NBA opens my eyes to the fact that racism is still alive and well. I interviewed George Plaskett, an immigrant and acupuncture therapist at my mother's work, uh, which includes three organizations, The Pillars, Safe in Harlem, and Let's Talk Safety. 
I interviewed him on many things that he thought were a problem in his community. He had a specific role in the Civil War in the Congo, uh, being a civilian scout. I asked his opinion on many topics, including his environment, being Harlem, and he had a lot to say. A lot of it was very deep and intriguing and interesting that people were being pushed out of the communities that they paid so much to live in, and that the youth were being changed right under our noses. After the interview, in a very soothing acupuncture treatment, I would recommend it to anybody. I, <laughs> I did my summer, uh, my whole summer course, and that's pretty much all that got me through my finals. Um, after that, I spoke to him about the youth because I thought it was really quite interesting that he thought, and he said that, you know, Harlem's kind of pressuring people into these situations and pressuring them into making these decisions that might not be the best for them. And it's gentrification that's doing that, as well as people trying to be like the problems that are plaguing their community. What he meant by this is that people are overestimating the power of the trigger. People try to be thugs, his words, not mine, because the physical control they lack through fear, if they put down their weapons, they can control more than just their minds, but their lives. From George, I learned what truly drove racism, and that's fear and power. This tweet, while it is in very good humor, um, <laughs> it, it's an example of a microaggression. Now, for those of you who might not know what it means, if you missed Diversity, Diversity Day, I'm sorry, that was really excellent. Um, microaggressions are these tiny little things that really amount to a lot. Something like this, it probably didn't even cross any of your minds. But ever since I saw this tweet, I've thought about it. And I've noticed that it always gets put in front of my stuff that they don't want my stuff to be mixed up with their stuff just because they see who I am. That's what truly gets to me. Whether it just be a pack of mint Oreos, they don't want it mixed in with their bread. And I get that. Maybe they're just trying to be healthy. Maybe they don't want junk food. I think it's something a little more than that. The book I read in preparation to talk to you all is called White Fragility. Why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. That's an example. Slavery, uh, Rosa Parks, the KKK. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to talk about that at all. I am, but I have to. And all of this is derived from fear. People fear that they would lose their place on the bus, that they would lose their power from being in the front of the bus, that they would lose their faith. You know, I don't really think that's faith at all. And it's this fear that keeps the white community from talking about racism now. And it's the fear, that same fear, that keeps the black community oppressed. If we could all clean the air and rid the world of the fear that plagues us all, I believe that we could all make a difference. Because of racism, the chip on my shoulder has turned into a crack on my side. As a child, I, I grew up in this time of racism and fear and xenophobia that we don't want people in our country, even though we're known as the mixing pot of the world. It's absurd. But what can we really do? They always say to put yourself into the shoes of another. But I believe that we really need to look into our own hearts and ask why we're afraid. So why are you afraid?